what we're doing. So we're working together with NVIDIA on a um, toolkit called Open Sequence to Sequence. And this is up on GitHub and it, it does what it says on the package. It takes in sequences and gives out sequences. That could be like a sequence of text that takes in and it gives out a sequence of text like English to Spanish translation. It could be taking in audio, giving out text. And even recently there's been sequences of brain waves coming in um, to, to give out um, text. So not, not an open sequence though, <laughs> yet. So what we're focusing on is the speak re speech recognition part where we're taking in audio and giving out text. And there's been a lot of development in this over the last few years. So together with image, um, this is an area that's really grown. And Baidu is one of the main, um, the main groups pushing the barriers here. They've brought out Deep Speech 1, 2, and 3. This is, we, we're looking at the Deep Speech 2 version. Um, Facebook also have an implementation out there which works very well called Wave the Letter. And there's also Jasper, just another speech recognizer. So these are set up the pre-configured, um, the, the configuration files for these are pre-set up in OpenSeq to seek and they're, they're ready to go. But you can set up your own configuration as well. So, um, yeah, so here we have deep speech. I won't go into the details of this because we cover this in a bit more detail. But in general, the, the audio to text translation, the way they work is to represent the data within a higher sort of level file to, re to represent the changes in the frequencies and so on in that audio file. That's by using a spectrogram. It's used for most implementations. Then put it through a neural net and then you get out a matrix at the end of, of, this, of the letters over time position and then decode that matrix into text. Um, the main difference between DeepSpeech and Jasper is Deep speech uses recurrent neural nets, so um, it's forward looking, and um, Jasper uses 1D convolutions all the way. So um, Jasper is, is quite fast because of that, but it uses a lot of 1D convolutions. So when we did this, um, we started off with deep speech, had some difficulties getting it going, spent, spent a good bit of time on it, but on on the cleaner data sets it was working, on the noisy data sets it didn't work out as well. And I'm sure it's not deep speech's problem. It's, it's um, whatever we were doing with it, we couldn't get it going. But pretty much straight off the bat, um, Jasper worked very well. So we went, like Mohammed said earlier, if something's not working, move into something else. Um, so we've been focusing on Jasper from that. So the way, the way to set up a pipeline in this is you, you take in your audio file so be wave there's quite a lot of information in there and it's it's quite difficult to expose that lower level of information into a neural net because you need to be able to fit it on the gpu so it's generally aggregated up onto onto like uh, mfcc spectrogram or log f bank all that is is aggregating it into a higher data set or a higher higher representation of that audio underneath then we put it through our neural net and we get out a matrix in the end and we'll be talking on this in a lot more detail and from that we use a thing called CTC loss I won't go through that now but I go through it a little bit later um, to get um, to, to de decompose that matrix down into text for inference it's the same thing you just pass that same that that same um, representation through, through the net, get out the matrix, but how you decompose that is a little bit differently. And we'll be talking through this quite, quite a bit um, on how, how this matrix is decomposed using greedy or a language model. Um, and when you get out your text, the way the error, metri the error metrics work is you look at the ground truth, you look at what you predicted, and you see how similar the words are. And it's, it's sort of similar to Levenstein distance um, to, to see how accurate you are. 
but it is difficult to get a good ma metric because often if you're doing word error rate or something you could have a slight misspelling in a word and it's it's you're penalized because you've got the word wrong whereas you could actually get totally the same word I mean totally a different word and you get penalized the same amount as having a small spelling mistake so there is some work on sort of context aware um, or conceptually aware metrics but um, most of most of the uh, work has been around word er word error rate so when we do speech to text um, there's two sides you have the audio files that come in and you have the transcriptions at the end and you have to set up the data you have to set up the audio to match the transcription at the end so what's typically done is what we want to do is get a time representation across the audio and say which which letters are being spoken are, are, are yeah being spoken at each time step along along that um, along the audio and to do that we need to set up the matrix for where the letters will fit or where the words would fit and um, we do that by setting up a vocabulary file so you see this here it starts off with spaces because you're going to if you give out a sentence you're going to need to have spaces in between words it has an apostrophe no commas or anything typically we strip those out lowercase a to z and then often in these data sets or if we're doing transcriptions um, in-house what we'd have is background noises like doors slamming or laughter or something and they're often tokenized so it, what, what I've often seen in those um, transcriptions is it might say laughter or laugh or something and what we wanted to do was sort of encode that instead of encoding it in a word encode it in a in a um, single character so we put in these this was some ideas from the video we put in these um, emojis and this one essentially represents laughter or laughing happening and this one is any other type of noise but these, these are the only things that the model can come out with and you need to make sure that your text only has this these characters prepare it that's that's sort of the trend making sure the transcriptions are prepared well for preparing the audio there's a few different considerations so we have the number of bits within the audio and this is how the audios are generally measured and if you've got audio from different places you need to be able to make sure they're they're all sort of aligned You've, you've got the same formatting in them. There's the bit rate, the number of pieces of information in each second. There's the channel. So similar to images where you have red, green, and blue channels, if you have an audio of two people speaking, like a phone call, you, you typically have one person on one channel, the other person on the other channel, and you can just split up the file. So, you, so on one file, you only hear one person speaking, another file you hear the other person speaking it's a bit like stereo where you hear guitars going on both sides of your ear um, and typically what we're doing is we want to work with single channel or else condense it if there's multiple people speaking condense it to a single channel and then we've got sample rate sample rate is along when somebody's talking how often are we sampling that sound coming out and it's quite important to have this this aligned this, this, here we're using 8,000 hertz, which for music or, or something will be quite a quite poor quality, but for phone calls, it's, it's pretty much, it's, it's, it's okay. You, usually 6,000 kilohertz will be used, or 16 kilohertz will be used, but 8,000 hertz has been working out for us as well. When when we encode that, and this came off a Kaggle kernel from a competition, um, I think it was from Google on utterances, so single words, and are you able to predict people saying single words? What we're doing here is trying to translate phone calls or something, and many of them may take up to 10 minutes, so you need to be able to 
get it right all the way along. Um, but the way that you can see in, in this kernel, um, they go through a lot of this representation of the audio. Um, so you've got spectrograms, filter back and MFCC. What they generally are is just a higher level aggregation of that audio. So, so that you don't have to fit the, the whole audio in to capture the changes in frequencies as, as we move across the audio. So we have less information to put into the net. I'm not an expert in this area, but um, that's... that's um, and um, the encoding... I won't go into a lot of detail because it is just one deconvolution, but it's sort of based on ResNet. I'm not sure if you use ResNet with these skip layers to bring the lower level representation up to higher layers. But um, it's just one D convolutions all the way. And because each convolutional layer is sort of looking over a wider area as we go, um, once we get to the highest layer of convolution, it's essentially looking over a couple of seconds. It's, it's, it's trying to capture the information from a couple of seconds of that audio. audio. So it's, it's sort of aware of what was said before and what was said after. Um, this is the, the configuration. I'll go into the results in a bit, but just to show you how you can set up the configuration. And it's sort of similar to CAFE or TensorFlow object detection with these configuration files. So you have up here your learning rate, um, your momentum decay. This is where you set up the net. The net, if you look at it, this would be the convolutional layers. They're repeated three times, the middle ones, 256 channels. Now, these are quite heavy nets. And the reason for this is because they need to learn, they need to learn how, what sounds go into letters, but they also need to, like if you're feeding it with the English language, they essentially need to learn how to spell words and they need to learn what words to put together. So it's a lot of information that we're trying to encode in here. And um, some of the smaller ones are five by three, we call where we do three repeats with five convolutional layers, or else 10 by five. Five repeats of each convolutional layer 10 times. And then, um, yeah. So when we go to the results, this is what comes out of the audio. I mean, sorry, this is what comes out of the net, okay? So, you remember the vocab file? The vocab file was what we said we wanted to capture, the letters we want to capture along, along each time step. These are essentially the time steps of the audio. And we want to be able to say, at each time step in the audio, what's being spoken, right? So, um, we start off here and there's a bias term down here, which is essentially saying, you can see green, green is high, high probability, red and yellow low, okay? So it's essentially saying nothing has been spoken up to a certain time when we come up here. And if you trace that across, you have I, right? So first letter is I, then it says nothing's been spoken. You get up here, trace it along and it's space. So what these, the decoders do, when they take this matrix, they crush the spaces down into one space. So we essentially got our first word here, which is I. And you can see the transcription down here, I had a number of dogs. And then it goes on to the next letter where you got H, A, D, and A. Ah. Um, when, when I first looked at this, one of the things that sort of struck me was there are some other greens, like this is just my own annotation. The model didn't come up with this black border here, put that in myself. So it looks, that's where your eye is immediately drawn. But there's some other space, greens around here. So for example, you can see around here, these greens. And if you trace that along, that's T. And the next one is H. And the next one up there is E. So that's spelling out the, okay? So here, here we have a place where the model came up here and said, um, 
okay, highest probability is A, but actually another chance that it said is death. And um, this, is, this is interesting because you see, on one hand, the model is trying to learn guttural sounds. So what we call an acoustic model, where they hear something like H, uh, like had, and they're able to spell out H-A-D, because it's very obvious with that. But on the other hand, the model is learning, is, is learning language, and it's essentially encoded a language. And it's, it said, if, if I've seen I had, then there's a high chance that the is coming up next. Even if the sound of what was being spoken isn't much similar to it at all. So, um, yeah. So why did it pick the a uh, and not the the? That's what I was sort of querying myself, wondering myself after I saw this. And then if you go along here, you can see the bias term. So you see in the first two letters, where the DTH is, the bias term is actually quite high. And at the third character, the bias term is, is lower. So it essentially ignores those first two letters, the TH, and it goes straight to the A. Because at that character, the highest probability is the A over the E. And that's essentially, by following that, that's a greedy decoder. And that's what this um, little bit of Python is doing up there. Funny, you're really fast at following how, this, how the Python is working. That's essentially what it's doing. It's just going over each time step. It's ignoring these guys. It's crushing the spaces and it's taking the max at each letter and then concatenating it all together. Okay. The language model is um, this guy is a little bit more more um, challenging, but it has it has some advantages, especially if you have not as much data, because um, one of the things is these transcriptions. It's quite expensive to have transcribed data. We we want we want um, the model to learn the language of the transcriptions. We want the model to be able to learn how to speak English or whatever language we put in off the transcriptions. But every piece of text that we use had to be manually transcribed from an audio. So I'm not sure if you ever like listen to music and try to write down the lyrics, but it, it's, quite, it's quite difficult um, to do that. First is if you're just writing text, for example, doctor notes or something, you have a lot of text data out there. So how can we use um, how can we use text data that wasn't necessarily in these transcriptions to be able to improve our results? So the way that language is written within within text to be able to improve these results, even if it's not within our transcribed files. And this is what a language model does. And it uses a thing called Beam Search and um, n-grams, which we've seen a lot of. Um, I'll talk first about how the n-grams are, are used. So um, let's say we got something like millions of doctor notes. We're, we're doing something in the medical field, and we want, we want to improve the output of this model based on medical terms. What we do is we get all of that text data, and we'd create, we'd say, what's the probability of word occurrences over that? And we would look at it in terms of the pairs of words that are happening together. For example, um, uh, high fever and trigrams. So three words coming up, four words coming up. And we just rank those probabilities, all those different combinations in terms of how likely they are to occur. So that's the first part of it, just getting the likelihood of the engrams in that sort of field, in, in that type of vocabulary, vocabulary that's being used. And then what we do is we, we, and I think Andrew Ng is here somewhere, and he did a great talk on beam search. We do a thing called beam search. And what beam search does is it starts, it sort of, creates beams across this audio. I'll explain out what that means exactly now. 
well, not exactly, but I'll give you a rough explanation. So it says, if you look along this, when, when we looked at this, we said, one possibility was I had a, but then another possibility was I had the, okay? So essentially there, you have two beams. One beam goes along here and along the had a, next beam along the had, I had the, right? And those beams, they wouldn't go straight down here. They start here, you'd have a beam here, you'd have a beam here, and you'd have a beam here. But they start, you, you set the cap on how many beams you have along, along the paths of most likelihood. And every time you come, you, you come across a new beam that's more likely, you pair back the old beams. And you say, I'm going to throw those away and just keep the, the most high likelihood beams. Does that sort of make sense? In a way. <laughs> okay. So now you've got beams going through here, going through the text on combinations of letters and sentences that can be said. And then you look inside the beams and it's, it's mapped back to the likelihood of those words being spoken within language. And it takes a combination of the likelihood of the beam within this matrix and the likelihood of that word being spoken within the corpus. And it chooses that. So in that case, it might say, okay, ah, doesn't make sense. I'm gonna go straight to the, based on what I've seen in the corpus. So um, yeah, this is, this is the training data that we've been using. Um, there's a public data set, Fisher data set, which is noisy data, it's 2,000 hours. 2,000 hours just to get the concept through, so like 24 hours in a day. So 2,000 hours is, I'm not sure if I can calculate it, but it's, it's a good many days of constant speaking. So it's a lot of information that's being fed in here. And it's important that we have noisy data because a lot of the phone calls we get, it's not, it's not in very clean settings. It could be people on mobile phones, um, heavy accents and stuff, and we want to be able to make it difficult for the model to learn this. We cut this in, into short segments to, to train on them. And we have our internal data sets as well. This is a public one where we have a thousand hours. The transcriptions aren't as good quality, but we're, we're working with that now and looking to source, to source more. Before, as well, sort of as well as showing out this, I wanted to show this is something from Baidu on the impact of our word error rate over the amount of data that we have. So you got here the word, the word error rate on a noisy data set and a regular data set. And here the amount of hours it was trained on. And you can see here, data really is king. So like if we were going up to 120,000 hours of audio, which is years and years of audio, you know, we could be getting down to 6% error rate. Um, even 12,000 is a good couple of years um, of constant speaking, but it, it gives pretty good, pretty good results. So to show what our results are, um, we've sort of worked separately on the two data sets. One is on the Fisher data set, which is the 2000 hours started off with deep speech, as I mentioned at the start, did very poorly at the start with that. And then, then together with some collaboration with NVIDIA, we worked on Jasper and got pretty, pretty close to um, the state of the art on, on this particular data set. I think the state of the art is somewhere just under 10%. So we were happy enough with 13% and started concentrating more on our, on our internal data set. Um, on, the, on the internal data set, initially some work would be done with, with another framework called Caldi. And um, we moved to Jasper and immediately made, you know, sort of true. Well, there's still some work going on with Caldi, but we, we've moved a lot over to Jasper now. So, um, oh yeah, one of, the, one of the problems that we've had is that we found transfer learning quite difficult. We thought we could just throw in a lot of different data into a model and do transfer learning. So for example, this shows 
a model that was learnt on the Fisher data and we tried to apply it to our internal data and you see here we've got like 82% word error rate. So it's something, it just needs more time, more TLC to be able to see what's going wrong here. And if anyone has any ideas, let us know. You see here, this talks about the two different models. So we've got the sort of bigger, Mo the, the bigger model in gray, which is the 10 by 3. So very, I didn't put in a number of parameters, like obviously it would be interesting to put in this, but this, this is a very heavy net. This thing is about one fifth the size, and you can see it trains a lot faster. I think that's over 24 V1, I mean, over four V100s. And the results are pretty close. And then it comes in around 16%, and applying a language model, we get 13%. This is some of the results. I hope you can read it. Um, this was the ground truth. This was Jasper with the greedy. So just taking the maximum character all the way along. And you can see there's some spelling mistakes, but actually just taking the neural net results, which is purely taking the max character, it does pretty well. Like I got your message, excuse me. Um, date of birth, 922, 96. Um, this is a cloud service that's out there, um, one of the top cloud services, and um, you can see the results up here, did, did very well, and this is, this is only one sample, so in this case, Jasper, the in-house training did a bit better than the cloud service, but the, in other samples, the cloud service had been doing better. I think what's interesting here is you can see, for example, again, we are a planning facility. It's We use a language model there to be able to fine tune our or improve our results based on medical data versus the cloud service which wouldn't wouldn't have used a language model specific for medical data and it came up with platypus ability um, but there's there's mistakes on either side and we're looking to to improve them so i think yeah it's very promising um, transfer learning Appears to be the way to go. It's something we're looking at, and how we'd be able to create more of a generalizable model. I don't know if it's fair to say it's not as easy as imaging. I know imaging is a challenging problem as well, but there's a lot of different sort of variables that go into setting up this. And um, yeah, it's not clear to speech to speech to speech. Definitely on different data sets, we've seen we've seen it's very difficult to transfer the results across. And that's not only the way the language is spoken, but also in terms of, you know, if they're coming through call systems, like Cisco or whatever, BIAS can be introduced, which you can give a, a, a different shape to the audio and make it more difficult for the audio to result. Um, didn't talk through cluster acceleration, but um, it's a whole other talk, but uh, yeah, it's, it's working well at the moment. And um, yeah, shout out to the team, Demic, Lena, Ravi, Katrin, and Leah, and um, as well the NVIDIA team, because yeah, a lot of work put in, and um, NVIDIA have been very good to us with helping out. So, any questions? Uh, you said it's an open. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, I need mine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you said it's an open project on GitHub. So is it, is it open for uh, external collaboration? Or? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's um it's it's open for external collaboration, and a lot of people are are using it and adding into it, okay. and there's pre-trained models up there as well. So you could even, so like some of the text data sets out there, I think LibreSpeech has a thousand hours of text available for anybody. And you can take some of the pre-trained models and push, 
pushed off next trip. So, yeah, so only the uh, the medical data set is uh, set aside for Optum and then any other things. Yes, yes, yeah. I think the Fisher data set, which is 2,000 hours of noisy, they charge for it, but anybody can get it. But the deliberate speech is free. And there's a couple of other good data sets out there that are free. Okay. I have a very brief question. Uh, this uh, will only work for the English language? And, and it, no, it depends on the data that you have. Um, but you would need a lot of data. I think we've done, we've been talking about doing something in Spanish. Um, but it, it works. You can see the, like, you saw the matrix that comes out. It's just a matter of putting the right characters in there, giving it enough data. And, um, I'm sure it'll work much better in, in other languages. Baidu might have done something in, um, I'm not sure which language they did it in, but, but they definitely did it in other languages than English. But have you explored about the Arabic as well? Um, I have not personally explored, but I'm sure there's no problem about doing it. I don't, I don't know the Arabic characters. Yeah. <laughs> I see your colleague sort of doubts. <laughs> so, uh, Maybe an interesting project. Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks, uh, uh, I just have uh, two two questions. Uh, if you go back to uh, uh, the slide that had uh, different probabilities, uh, things. Yeah, I'm just wondering why um, emojis had higher probabilities during times when not only was spoken. Like that. Sure you this in yeah, it's it's a it's a very good question. Um, I I'd suspect it's that, and it's probably open to a whole lot of interpretations. Yeah. Somebody else could come up with something totally different. I'd suspect it's that at times when nothing's been spoken and there's a noise in the background, um, that's where you can hear the noises versus when somebody's speaking, the noise is done. Our, our laughter, um, yeah, like if we look here, I think noise is the most likely one. Laughter at the start, I don't know if people come on phone calls and they're laughing, but, um, or maybe they laugh at the end. But um, definitely outside of these uh, areas, I think that's where, and also the fact that no other letters are being spoken, it probably makes them a bit higher. In places where letters are being spoken, it would push down that. So, so I don't have an exact answer for that. <laughs> okay, um, for the second question, can you move to the next slide? Sure. Yeah, so um, I think the one after that is... No, the one before, I think. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if uh, these are only feed-forward uh, nets. Uh, I mean, for example, when you say I had, and then uh, using the language model, it predicts that A is a higher probability than B and on. But does it? Is there like a backward propagation? So, for example, if it, if it predicted the, and then like two or three other years were spoken after the, can it go back to the and then correct it to the, for example? So, um, the beam search would, the, well, the beam search sends off beams and as long as and it does it in a greedy approach so it might send off a thousand at the start and then start pairing them back as it comes into more likely one so you can set up 16 beams is fast thousand beams is what's typically used for state of the art as as long as those thousand beams have those different words in there and those words are also high probability and they they're very high in here then it, it should capture them. But the other thing to think about, I mentioned very early, when you take the convolutional layers, they actually, they, we, what we heard is the receptive field of those convolutional layers. Because we have so many stacks, they're looking over about a second and a half each side. So the words that are said before and after, the model will be considering this. Hi, Eric. Um, thanks for talking. I was just wondering, uh, why do you think um, speech recognition is harder than image recognition? I was wondering, what, what about it makes it 
the main aim of traction evolution is just transfer learning works, that's a good element, it's also a good system. Yeah, it's a good question. Maybe that I haven't got it fully working yet, but... <laughs> um, I'd say the amount, of, the amount of different things to do with it, and I know you need to do this in image as well, but, you know, we, we have the length of the audios we need to to pair back and then like one of the challenges I didn't go through if you have if you have for example a uh, three minute audio or something and you have the transcriptions if you're one and a half minutes through the audio which word is that what's been spoken which word is that matching up to and then as well I guess like typically an image you have zero to two five five and three channels and um, here we can have you know the channels we can have um, the frequencies and then a lot to be done in the text because everything in NLP we basically well most things in NLP we need to do here with the transcriptions so Maybe I'm a bit biased saying it's a more difficult problem. I see. So. <laughs> and, um, but like not to not to underestimate image, I guess. And maybe as well, it's that there's not as much work that's been done in the field, even though an awful lot of work has been done in the field. Uh, I guess another question is a bit more vague. So I guess this is kind of like syntactic kind of understanding. Like, I wonder, like, I don't know. Uh, what are your thoughts on what makes the magazine kind of understand and how, how much of a thing you can do that? That makes sense. Um, oh, I don't know how, how it's. Uh, I don't know, sorry, so people in like product design see you understand your language a bit more things. Intelligence. Just wondering how, how you think the semantic understanding of language is coming off. And is there anything you press on there? Or? Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't gone in a lot a lot to it personally. But like one thing I was very interested in is the work. There's some work recently published with brainwaves. I'm not sure if that's related to your question. But they were measuring the waves and then sort of seeing how that matches into acoustics and it's interesting that they can take any sort of signals and pass it in but um yeah where where this is going with the with the language um, that's a great answer for that thanks do we have any more questions? Okay, I can swap. Hello. How are you suffering multiple conversation? How are you deciphering multiple people conversation? Oh, um, so for example, a lot of people talking simultaneously. Is it possible to decode the conversation? So, luckily for us, we're using phone calls and in phone calls you either have one person speaking which would be a voicemail or you have two people speaking and um, yeah if two people are, sp are speaking simultaneously yeah. is it possible to decode the speech yeah there um, it comes down to the channels so luckily the, the recording of those typically captures it that you can break out um, based on one person speak because it, with two phones you'll have one one side of the phone line will be on one channel the other side so we didn't have to do anything very fancy there yes yeah. so split, for example the audio. For if 10 people are speaking simultaneously you would need 10 channels right yeah yeah that would be very challenging okay <laughs> but we don't sorry that you don't have I know it's a difficult one to do but I haven't um, come up to that Thank you so much. Thank you.